So now we're going to talk about how primary production works. So primary production, if you remember, is going to be, in general, the amount of light energy converted into chemical energy. So how much, basically, photosynthesis is happening. And that's going to actually create the energy budget for that food web, right, or for that ecosystem. So, like I said, most of the primary producers are going to use light energy. Um, there are going to be a couple that are going to do chemosynthesis, but we're going to talk mostly about photosynthetic organisms. Um, one crazy number that I think is very important to realize is that we've got all this sunlight coming to Earth, and only 1% of that actually gets converted to chemi chemical energy with photosynthesis. That's a crazy number. Now you can see why there's so much research going into solar, right? So... One thing that you want to remember is that you're going to have different ecosystems, the desert, the rainforest, you know, the savanna. All of those different ecosystems are going to have different amounts of primary production. And so they're going to contribute different amounts to the total primary production happening on Earth. So um, there are going to be limiting factors to primary productivity depending on what type of ecosystem you're looking at. If we're looking at a marine ecosystem, so we're looking at the oceans, which take up most of the... Um, the Earth's surface, light is obviously going to be the first limiting factor because the deeper you go, the less light there is. So the light eventually does limit the primary production. It's not happening in those deep abysses and that type of stuff. And if it is, it's not a lot, right? Um, then the other thing is going to be nutrient availability. So when you think about um, coral reefs and how beautiful that looks and all of the crystal clear water, it is gorgeous, but actually what's happening there is there's not a lot of nutrients there because if there were, it would be a little cloudy from all the nutrients. So um, pro production is going to be very limited by the nutrient availability and how that can happen. So the two main nutrients that are very limiting are going to be nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so it's kind of interesting because anything in the ocean, when they get exposed to nitrogen and phosphorus, they bloom and go crazy. Um, the reason that they think there's bad algae blooms happening in the ocean is because of fertilizer runoff and that type of thing. On a more gross level, because you know I always got to bring it there, um, if you've ever puked on, off of a boat, which um, I do all the time because I get seasick. Yes, marine biologists who get seasick. Um, and when you puke, all the fish come up and they're like, woohoo! And that's because it's full of a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus. So there's a little learning moment for you and something you can point out to your friends if they or you get seasick. Um, now, in a terrestrial ecosystem, this is going to be on land, there's going to be a lot more things that can be limiting. Temperature, moisture, and nutrients. So obviously water is going to be a huge thing, right? So um, you're going to have that being a limiting factor of where plants are going to grow. Then you've also got temperature, if it's too cold for the plants to grow. And then obviously, um, you know, soil is going to come into play as well. So different things limit in marine ecosystems versus terrestrial ecosystems. Now, <clears throat> the next thing we're going to talk about is secondary production. So organisms are going to eat those primary producers, and they're going to convert some of that into their own biomass. So basically, um, the way I think of secondary production is how much of that food calories worth ends up becoming your calories worth in the next level, right? So if I ate a hamburger, how many of those calories actually went to me and made me worth more calories if something was going to eat me, okay? Um, secondary production is an interesting thing because it's very inefficient, especially in terrestrial ecosystems. We're terrible at it, okay? Um, so the energy transfer is usually less than 20%. So we lose a lot of energy from one level to the next. And a lot of that is going to be wasted on staying alive, fecal matter, that type of thing. So we can call different organisms um, by their production efficiency. So some things are going to be very efficient at creating more biomass and not wasting a lot of that energy staying alive, whereas others are not going to be very good at it. Um, and I have a, ooh, sorry, <laughs> I have a good picture to kind of show you what I'm talking about here. So if you look at this, this is going to be an, a caterpillar that's eating the plant material. So let's say the plant material is equal to 2000, or 200 joules, which is a unit of energy. Um, half of that is going to waste. 
then 67 of those are going to cell respiration, which is just keeping that organism alive, and only 33 joules are actually getting converted into new biomass. So right away, we're going from 200 to 33 from that leaf, right? So we've made a huge jump and we've lost a lot of energy. Now certain organisms are going to be better than others at um, converting energy, right? So like things that are warm-blooded really are not good at production efficiency because we waste a lot of energy keeping our body temperature warm. Um, to put it into a human perspective, you know that there's people that um, can like eat 50 Big Macs a day and they don't gain any weight. Well, they have terrible production efficiency because they're not creating a lot of new biomass. Whereas someone like me who just looks at a french fry and gets fat, I actually have really good production efficiency. So I'm awesome for the food chain is the way that I'm going to think about it and uh, I'm going to go with that. Okay, so in the next video we're going to get into trophic efficiency and how that actually works in food pyramids, food chain pyramids.